Well, hello again, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am Nurse Mo, and I will be studying respiratory assessment with you today. Before we dive into that topic, let's take a quick minute for a very much appreciated listener shout out. And this one goes out to Cora, who says, I just want to say thank you for all you do. I listen to your podcast every single day when I was in school and when I was studying for the NCLEX. I just took my NCLEX on Wednesday and I passed. Thank you for making things easy to understand. Cora, way to go. Congratulations on passing your NCLEX, getting your license, getting through school, all of it. I'm just thrilled that I could play even a tiny bit of a role in your success. Thank you so much for sending in that update. I love reading everyone's success stories and how the podcast has helped them. So if you want to submit a review, then I'll definitely read it and you'll probably get to be a listener shout out someday. So go ahead and rate and review this podcast. All right. So we're talking about respiratory assessment. And if I had to choose one focused assessment that I've done more than any other, it would be respiratory followed closely by neurological assessments. And that's because I worked in the medical ICU and many of our patients were in there on ventilators in there because of some respiratory malfunction. So I've done a lot of respiratory assessments. And now working in the recovery room, I am all about that airway, which plays into this as well. So in this episode, you're going to learn the basics of what goes into a respiratory assessment. Now, before you get into this topic, if you're brand, brand new, I highly suggest that you go and check out episode 89, which is about oxygenation concepts. If you have that background foundation knowledge, it's going to help you understand this so much better. And I'll be here for you when you get back. Okay, so you've listened to episode 89, and now you're back, and it's time to dive into respiratory assessment together. Now, a general respiratory assessment is going to be relying a lot on what you see with your eyes and hear with your ears. Your assessment will also be guided by any underlying respiratory disorders And of course, what's currently going on with the patient's physiology and their plan of care. You're always using that framework to guide your assessments. And you'll get better at doing this as you get more clinical experience. For example, a patient with a chest tube will have assessments very specific to that device. And a patient with asthma is going to be assessed differently than a patient with congestive heart failure. You're going to be assessing for different things. So let's go through a basic adult respiratory assessment step by step. Now, if you're interested in learning about pediatrics and respiratory, go and listen to episode 140 after this one. So the very first component of my respiratory assessments is observation. This is going to be the first thing that I do. This is going to let me know immediately if the patient is having trouble so I can quickly intervene. So what do I mean by observation? Does the patient look like they're having any respiratory distress or respiratory compromise? This could look like increased work of breathing, tachypnea, air hunger, pursed lip breathing, agonal breathing, not breathing. So that would be your first initial thing. A quick look can tell you a lot. Now, increased work of breathing, I'm going to be observing for that. And that is present when accessory muscles are being utilized to facilitate breathing. You may also hear this called accessory muscle use for this reason. The most obvious muscles to watch are the scalenes and sternocleidomastoid, but you'll also want to observe the pectoralis major, trapezius, and external intercostals. If it appears the patient is using any accessory muscles to facilitate breathing, they're in trouble and require prompt intervention because those muscles are going to get tired, right? And when the muscles tire and the patient's been working really hard and now they can't work really hard to compensate anymore, guess what happens? Decompensation. 
I'm also observing the respiratory rate. A normal rate is 10 to 20, though you will see 12 to 20. Sometimes you'll see 12 to 24, which I feel like 24 is way too high. So 10 to 20 is a pretty common range for what's considered normal. Anything below 10 breaths per minute is going to be considered bradypnea or too slow breathing. And a rate above 20 is tachypnea or too fast breathing. Remember, brady means slow and tacky means fast. I'm also going to observe the patient's position. For example, a patient who is sitting up and leaning forward with their hands on their knees is in the classic tripod position, which helps facilitate lung expansion. You've probably assumed this position after you've run up several flights of stairs, right? It's also common in patients experiencing respiratory compromise due to things like emphysema, asthma, and COPD. I'm also observing the patient's level of consciousness. A patient who is restless or agitated may be exhibiting signs of hypoxia. Conversely, a patient who is somnolent or obtunded may be in respiratory acidosis, which is very common in COPD exacerbations. Decreased level of consciousness could also be due to respiratory failure, which often occurs after a period of intense respiratory effort as the body has tried to compensate. I'm also going to make note if the patient is drooling. Drooling can be associated with airway obstruction or epiglottitis, which makes swallowing difficult and painful. Though more common in children, epiglottitis can occur in adults, and I have to tell you, it's really scary. I'm also observing for chest rise and fall that is equal on both sides. First of all, chest rise and fall indicates that respiratory effort is in place. That does not always mean air is moving. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it does mean like the mechanics of respiration are intact. And then I want to make sure it's happening equally on both sides. Trauma victims can have fractured ribs that contribute to a destabilization of the chest wall. This is called a flail chest. Another common cause of asymmetrical chest wall movement is pneumothorax. I'm also observing for how deep the breaths are. Are they shallow? Are they really deep? Or do they look kind of normal? Shallow breathing could indicate the patient is over sedated or, you know, maybe they've had too many opioids. Very deep and very fast breathing is a sign of metabolic acidosis often seen in diabetic ketoacidosis. I'm also looking for the respiratory pattern. Is it regular or irregular? An irregular breathing pattern such as Shane Stokes respirations is an indicator of neurological impairment. Is the patient moving air? You can hold a hand in front of their nose and mouth and feel for that or watch for their breath to fog up a simple oxygen mask if they're using that. And that is what I was mentioning a moment ago. The chest may be going up and down, but you put your hand there and there's no air movement. So the patient's trying to get breath in and out, right? Things are, you know, the mechanics are there, but there's no air movement. They're probably occluding their airway. I see this all the time in the recovery room where the patients maybe have some obstructive sleep apnea or they are just still so sedated when they come out of surgery that they're not able to keep their airway open. So on those patients, we have to do a chin lift or a jaw thrust maneuver to keep the airway open, or we place an NPA or an OPA to keep the airway open. Happens all the time. I'm also looking at the skin signs. In light or fair-skinned individuals, low oxygen levels is going to cause that cyanosis, which is that bluish discoloration to the skin. You also can see cyanosis at the nail beds and the lips. Now, in darker skinned individuals, it's not going to look the same. Cyanosis may be more evident as pallor, and this is more evident on the inside of the lower lip, on the conjunctiva, and on the palms. In individuals with yellowish skin tones, cyanosis presents as more of a grayish-greenish 
discoloration. You're also looking for clubbing. Is clubbing present? Clubbing of the nails is a swelling of the soft tissue that flattens the nail bed and is often present in conditions like lung cancer, interstitial lung disease, and COPD. I'm also observing for a cough. Is the patient coughing? If the patient has a productive cough, I'm assessing the sputum for the amount, the color, the odor, and the consistency. So when we look at sputum amounts, you're going to have to quantify this. It will be scant, which is just a little bit, a small amount, a moderate amount, or a large amount. And I realize this is a bit subjective. Do your best. For color, typically white or clear sputum is going to be viral illness. A yellow or greenish sputum is more likely to be associated with bacterial illness. If the sputum has black in it, this could be coal dust if the patient works in a coal mine, which people still do. It could also indicate smoke inhalation. And then blood-tinged or rust-colored sputum could be present in tuberculosis and in some types of pneumonia. And then the odor of the sputum. If it's foul, foul odor, this is usually associated with a bacterial pneumonia or a lung cancer. And then the consistency. Is it thick or is it thin? Thick sputum is more difficult to clear So always be thinking of airway protection and airway patency if your patient has really thick sputum. And then I'm also observing to see if the patient is able to communicate. Can they speak full sentences without pausing for breath? If not, this is a sign of shortness of breath. And then I'm grabbing my stethoscope. So the next component of a respiratory assessment is to listen Using the diaphragm of the stethoscope, you're going to listen to your patient's lungs in that Z pattern, and you'll do that both posteriorly and anteriorly. You do a Z pattern because you're comparing right side to left side on each area of the lungs. So there are three types of lung sounds, and this will probably be on one of your fundamentals exams, three types of lung sounds, bronchial sounds, bronchovesicular, and vesicular. So we have bronchial and vesicular. Those are the two main. And then bronchovesicular is kind of a combo of those. So when you're assessing these lung sounds, you're essentially confirming that they are audible in the location where you expect to find them. When those specific lung sounds are heard outside of that specific location, this is an abnormal finding. And I'll explain this more here. So bronchial sounds are high-pitched and loud, high volume, high pitch. You'll hear them over the trachea and the larynx. And you may also hear these referred to as tracheal breath sounds for this reason. When these bronchial or tracheal breath sounds are heard in other areas of the lung, this could be an indication of disease such as pneumonia. So it's really easy. You can take your stethoscope and place it over your own trachea area and take some breaths and you'll get a feel for what I mean by high pitched and high volume. Now, Vesicular sounds are auscultated in the peripheral lung fields and make up the majority of the lung sounds that you're going to be listening for. They are lowest in pitch and lowest in volume than the other sounds. And then kind of in between are the bronchovesicular sounds. So these are moderate in pitch and moderate in amplitude or volume. You can hear bronchovesicular sounds mid-sternum and posteriorly between the scapula. Again, if you hear any of these pitches, any of these sounds where you don't expect to hear them, it's a sign that there's something abnormal going on. Now, abnormal breath sounds can be diminished, absent, or adventitious. So diminished and absent lung sounds are going to be associated with decreased airflow, decreased lung expansion, or even absent airflow and absent lung expansion. This can be due to a bunch of different factors such as pleural effusions, hypoventilation, secondary to sedation, 
airway obstruction, pneumothorax, there's a lot of reasons why someone could have decreased airflow, decreased lung expansion. Now, adventitious sounds are audible, abnormal sounds. These include crackles, ronchi, wheezes, strider, and plural friction rub, sometimes just called plural rub. So let's start with crackles. You may also hear these called rails. Same thing, different terms, because hey, why not just make things as confusing as possible, right? So crackles or rails can be fine, or they can be coarse. Fine crackles are often caused by atelectasis. Typically, the more coarse crackles are caused by things like aspiration or pulmonary edema. You may hear someone describe coarse lung sounds as wet lung sounds, like, I'm concerned about Bob, his lung sounds are wet, and his urine output has decreased. So wet lung sounds really common with things like pulmonary edema and ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, ronchi are low-pitched breath sounds that are often compared to a snoring sound. Ronchi can be heard on both inspiration and expiration and are most likely to be heard in those larger airways. A very common cause of ronchi is airway obstruction or partial airway obstruction due to the thick mucus that is present in cystic fibrosis. Wheezes are high-pitched sounds, often associated with asthma and COPD. Wheezes can be inspiratory or expiratory, and it's important to note that a lack of wheezing and someone experiencing an acute asthma exacerbation is usually a pretty bad sign. It means the airways have now become too constricted and there is very little to no air moving. This patient needs intervention stat. Strider occurs when the upper airway is obstructed. It's a harsh, high-pitched sound heard during inspiration. And if you have someone in Strider, you're going to know it's loud, they're in distress, and it's really scary. So Strider is definitely not a subtle finding. You will notice it. The key is to know what to do to treat their airway obstruction. A lot of times it's because of airway swelling, so medications to decrease airway swelling are often used to treat strider. A pleural friction rub, again, sometimes just called a pleural rub, is a grating sound that can occur with inspiration and expiration. It is due to inflamed pleural surfaces rubbing against one another, and it can occur in conditions such as pleurisy, or pleural effusion. Okay, so for this next one, I'll be honest, I've never done this in the clinical setting where I've worked, but it doesn't mean you won't do it. And it certainly doesn't mean you won't be tested on it in your fundamentals or skills or assessment lab. So we will be assessing pulmonary status by listening to voice sounds. In healthy lungs, the organs are filled with air. Those lung organs are filled with air and this does not transmit sound effectively. So if you're listening to your patient's lungs and you're having them speak, it should be a muffled sound that's normal. But when a substance is present that transmits sound more effectively, such as fluid or a solid mass, you'll be able to hear the sounds more clearly. So we assess for three types of voice sounds. Bronchophony, egophony, and whispered pectoriloquy. So let's first talk about bronchophony. To assess for bronchophony, listen to the lung fields as the patient says the words 99. A normal finding is that the words will be indistinct. Remember, air is not going to transmit sound well, so it will be muffled. If you can hear the words clearly, this is positive for bronchophony, and is an abnormal finding. Egophony is listening to the lung field while the patient says E, E, E. A normal finding is that you will hear the E sound. 
when consolidation is present and it's transmitting the sounds differently, you'll hear an A sound as in hey. Okay, so egophony, you want to hear E. If you hear A, that's not A-OK. So there you go. I just gave you a quick, easy way to remember that. And then I always have a hard time saying this, whispered pectoriloquy. So to assess for this, you will listen to the lung fields while the patient whispers, one, two, three. In healthy lungs, you'll hear very faint sounds or perhaps nothing at all. If you can hear the words clearly, this indicates an abnormality of the lung tissue, such as consolidation or a mass. And we can also assess respiratory with palpation. So the two key assessments that you will conduct with your hands are for tactile frematis and crepitus. So tactile frematis, you may hear called vocal frematis. This is a pronounced area of vibration, essentially, over areas of lung consolidation. And it is diminished in cases of hyperinflation or when fluid is present. So go ahead right now and place your hands on your sternum and say a few words. You will feel tactile frematis. It's not abnormal to have it. It's going to be abnormal if it's pronounced or if it's diminished. So to assess your patient for tactile frematis, you're going to place either the palms of your hands or the ulnar side of your hands, either way is fine, on the posterior chest or on the back and ask the patient to say either 99 or 1, 2, 3. And as they say this, you're going to move your hands to those exact same areas where you would normally place your stethoscope and you're comparing the amount of vibration from side to side. Now, remember, when you're listening with your stethoscope, you're doing one side and then the other. When you're assessing for tactile frematis, both hands are on at the same time, so you can feel it at the same time to compare. Now, for a pro tip, you can ask the patient to cross their arms in front of their chest, and this will kind of open the upper back and displace the scapula for easier palpation. Now, to assess for crepitus, which is also known as subcutaneous emphysema, you'll simply palpate that chest wall. So crepitus feels like bubble wrap under the skin, and it's caused by air getting into the subcutaneous tissue. It's really common in patients who have chest tubes, chest trauma, pneumothorax, mechanical ventilation, you know, leading to some barotrauma pulmonary blebs, and even tears in the airway. A key part of your chest tube assessment will be to determine if crepitus is present around that insertion site and how far it expands so that you can monitor if it's worsening or resolving. Sometimes the crepitus can go far. I've had patient with crepitus all the way up into their forehead. So you have to, once you, you know, you kind of find where it is, you just start assessing outward and determine how far it extends. And then something you'll learn in the skills lab is to assess for symmetrical chest expansion by using your hands. So place your hands around the chest wall with thumbs at T9 or T10, like right there in that area, and ask the patient to take a deep breath in. Your hands, essentially your thumbs, that's what you're watching, should move out symmetrically. So that's how you assess respiratory status with palpation. Nurse Mo here. Are you tired of sitting at your desk studying for exams or the NCLEX? What would it feel like to get a bit of your life back so you could get up from your desk, go for a run, do things around the house, take care of errands, or even just take the dog out for a walk? Bet you can't because you need to study. Or can you? With Study Sesh, you will use auditory formats to the max to accelerate your learning, free yourself from your desk, and get your life back. Study Sesh is more than just a podcast. It's a form of highly effective auditory learning that is so much more than listening. Study Sesh involves thinking, analyzing, and even responding. This keeps your brain highly engaged in a way that doesn't involve reading 
or staring at a screen. Stephanie says, the audio flashcards are a total game changer. I am hooked. And Amy says, it forces me to use my recall of information and critical thinking without the option of choosing from four answers. The drills are brilliant, again, forcing me to fully understand the information. And Kara says, I thought I loved the regular Straight A Nursing podcast, but Study Sesh is on a whole other level. Combined, they provide excellent study material, and I feel like I've struck audiovisual learning gold. Study Sesh includes over 100 study sessions in four formats. Most are the highly popular pod quizzes, and the others are in case study format, power hours, and drills. Plus, more in-depth topics come with study guides. Want to free yourself from your desk while you study for exams or the NCLEX? Enroll in Study Sesh today. Go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash study dash sesh to learn more. That's straightanursingstudent.com forward slash study dash sesh. I can't wait to be your study buddy. And then the final area, and I'm not necessarily doing this last, but it's just the last one that I'm talking about here, is the questions that I'm asking the patient are going to be part of that respiratory assessment. And the questions you ask are going to be guided by their unique symptoms, by their disease pathology. But some key questions to ask are, do you smoke? If the answer is yes, you want to know how many packs per day and for how many years. And you take that number and you multiply that together to get something called the pack year history. Now, if the patient has a cough, you would want to ask how long have they had their cough and if it occurs more in the morning versus kind of, you know, all the time throughout the day and night. A morning cough that resolves is pretty common in someone who smokes and is considered a smoker's cough. It's also more likely to be present in someone with COPD, bronchitis, and those with post-nasal drip or seasonal allergies, though, of course, the coughing associated with these conditions can occur at any time. Now, a cough that lasts more than eight weeks is considered a chronic cough, and that can be due to a medication such as an ACE inhibitor. That's one of the most annoying side effects, and I think one of the most common reasons why people stop taking ACE inhibitors and either don't take their medication or ask to be switched to something different. It's also common with uh, GERD, asthma, tuberculosis, cancer, asthma, and yes, COPD. A sudden onset acute cough could be due to allergies or it could be due to infection, though it's important to note that the cough from an infection like pneumonia or bronchitis could linger for several weeks and and kind of almost mimic that chronic cough. So you have to assess like when did the cough start? Is it associated with other symptoms, et cetera? You definitely want to assess shortness of breath. A very simple question that doesn't lead the patient is, do you have any difficulty breathing? Though dyspnea, shortness of breath, can be observed, you also want to ask the patient their experience because they may be feeling shortness of breath before it's actually observable. Now, you can have them score their dyspnea on a rating scale, just like you do with a pain assessment. And your charting system may even have a scoring system in place. It could be a a zero to five. It could be a zero to 10, a zero to three, whatever your facility uses. But it's a great way to get um, a more quantifiable way to measure that shortness of breath. You also want to assess for paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea. So ask the patient, do you ever wake up suddenly in the middle of the night feeling out of breath? And that would be a sign of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And this is a condition where the patient just abruptly wakes up, they feel short of breath, they sit up instinctively, and that sitting up helps resolve their shortness of breath. And then orthopnea is a difficulty breathing or a shortness of breath when lying flat. So asking the patient, how many pillows do you sleep on at night? And if they're like, I just sleep on one pillow like a normal person, lady, then they probably don't have orthopnea. But if they say, oh yeah, I sleep in a recliner or I sleep propped up on four pillows, 
ding, 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 this patient likely has orthopnea. So there you have it. That's kind of my basic guideline for a respiratory assessment. Please note that detailed assessments can vary based on each unique situation. So always using your best judgment and clinical resources as guides. So I hope you join me again next week for another episode of the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I will see you then. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. Hey, I'm not perfect. Anything, 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 anything. Drooling can be associated with airway obstruction or even epilogue. Oh my God, I can't talk today. Stridal, stridal, stridal. And whispered. Pectoro- pectoriloquy. I can't say it. And displace the spa- the spatula, the spatula, seriously.